Hello, uh, and welcome to our second installment of our three-part CPF Fellows Roundtable series. Um, my name is Harry Burke. I'm the Fellows Manager here at CPF, and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, today's discussion is being broadcast through Facebook Live and will be an episode on our podcast, The Bully Pulpit, which can be found wherever you get your podcasts. Today's discussion will center around the future of progressive politics and policy, from Senator Bernie Sanders pushing the Democratic Party towards Medicare for All to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez championing the Green New Deal. Progressive ideas have gained more traction in recent years, and now that Joe Biden is president, uh, we're going to look at what exactly this means for progressive policies now that they might have a real chance to materialize. So I'm joined today by current and former fellows here at the, at the Center for the Political Future. Shaniqua McClendon is a, the political director at Crooked Media, and before that worked on Capitol Hill, serving as policy advisor to Senator Kay Hagan and legislative director to Congresswoman Alma Adams, and she's currently a fellow here this semester at CPF. Barbara Boxer is the former United States Senator from California who served in the Senate from 1992 to 2017, for that serving 10 years in the House of Representatives and was a member of the Marin County Board of Supervisors. She was a fellow uh, during the fall 2020 semester. And Dan Schwerin is the co-founder of Evergreen Strategy Group, a strategic messaging and speech writing firm. Before co-founding Evergreen, he was Secretary Hillary Clinton's longtime director of speech writing, book collaborator and policy advisor. Uh, Dan was part of our first cohort of fellows in the fall of 2018. Uh, so I have a few questions here myself, but uh, a lot of the questions that we're gonna be running through in this program today are gonna come straight from USC students. Um, so basically the way it's gonna work is I'm gonna um, promote uh, USC students to become panelists. So you webinar attendees will be able to see them and hear them. They're gonna ask their questions to our fellows and they're gonna answer them, maybe have a little bit of a back and forth and then we'll send them back down to make way for the next questioner. I might throw a question in here or there. Um, you, of course, if you're not a USC, USC student and you are interested in asking a question, you can input it in the Q&A box and we will hopefully have some time at the end for those questions. But first, uh, I'm gonna start with our first um, student question who is being promoted right now to a panelist. And USC students, when you are promoted and you can unmute your cameras and microphones, if you could please state your name, your year and your major along with your question. Hi everyone, my name is Zoe, I'm a senior. I'm a double major in journalism and political science. I think that's everything. Um, and my question is after the last four years and the presidency that has left Americans more divided than ever, how can young people help to make the future of progressivism look less polarizing? Harry, you just want us to jump in or yeah. had you wonder? Would you like to start, Barbara? Of course, of course. A US center is always ready to say something. <laughs> Hopefully it's meaningful. We'll have to get 60 votes though at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> there you go. Well, Zoe, I, I have I was smiling when you said what you did because you said your double major, poli sci and journalism. And after I lost my first race, it was the only race I ever lost. In 1972, I decided to become a journalist and, and my beat was um, the county. And I was able to cover the guy who beat me for four years. I was able to do all the coverage of that guy. It was really very good revenge, but um, and then four years later, I, I ran. But I think the combo of journalism and political science is excellent because if you can't express your thoughts, it's meaningless to people. And I guess that leads me to your question. How can young people um, you know, push progressive ideas and not have uh, people run away and say, I don't wanna hear it. I think if you do it from your personal experience, Zoe, it really works best. You know, I find that I can disarm tough audiences when, immigra you know, immigration is always a very tough issue. And in the beginning, when I was in the House of Representatives, we had issues at the border like this and, and other issues. And I, I, there would people come to my town halls and they'd be, you know, some for it and some against it. But the way I think I diffused the situation was to say, you know, if it wasn't for America, my whole family would have been destroyed uh, by, by Hitler. And, and I went through all that and, and that my dad was the only one of nine kids to be born in America. And he, 
he literally said to me, kiss the ground, you live in America. So it was a way to kind of diffuse the hot stuff around immigration. So, you know, it's something that you alone have a passion for. Use that, don't parrot other people. I don't care who they are, whether it's me or AOC or Bernie or Biden, it doesn't matter. Tell it from your heart. And I think you'll manage to diffuse the situation. Um, I, I think that's absolutely right. And hi, Zoe's in my class this semester. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I, I think I like personally don't believe that progressivism, when you think about the values there um, and beliefs is polarizing in itself. Um, unfortunately, our politics have just become very polar polarizing. Um, I mean, not recently. Um, uh, and I've talked about this in class, but I started working on the Hill in 2010, right before the midterms. And that's, I just kind of saw everything really, um, the parties kind of get further away from each other. But I think something that you all, um, that young people can do is really, as Senator Boxer said, just really relate your personal experiences to these policies that you really care about. Because in all honesty, you know, I, I think, and I don't, Hope that hopefully this doesn't come off the wrong way. I think it's definitely, um, you know, older generations who are kind of presented with this false dichotomy that like all the things that progressives want are like really out there and really crazy. Um, but a lot of young people see these things and think, oh, everyone should have access to healthcare. Everyone should have access to a quality education. And those are not crazy things. But when you have places like Fox News telling you that those things are crazy and giving you what seem to be legitimate facts, you can start to really believe those things. And so I think if you have, as, as you have access to your family, um, your parents, you know, just people in general in your community um, and within your ecosystem, relating those things that seem like these crazy progressive ideas to how they would impact your own life. The other thing, uh, you know, young people are very present on social media. So I think socializing a lot of the issues that progressives talk about and really just pulling back any partisan or crazy rhetoric that surrounds the things that you want. Um, generally, things that are seen as polarizing are just things that are seen as disrupting the status quo that's working for someone. Um, and if you can start to show that change is something positive that will help a lot of people, I don't think it becomes as, uh, as polarizing. I would just, I, I agree with everything that's been said and hi, I'm Dan Schwer and I'm really glad to be here and um, with two uh, such great um, fellow panelists. Uh, I think that I would just add is we certainly are, we have deep divisions in the country and if you are on social media, it sometimes may seem even magnified, but a really remarkable thing that's, I feel like that's happened right now and recently is uh, the popularity of the rescue package that just passed and actually the popularity of President Biden are both really kind of surprising if you start with the presumption that we are a super uh, divided country and that you would not have been forgiven after the last several years of thinking that no president was ever going to be over 50 percent in approval and that no piece of big complicated progressive legislation was ever going to be you know 60 70 percent approval in the country. We're just too divided for that. Well, actually, Joe Biden is quite popular and his signature progressive legislation is amazingly popular. That could change over time. Attacks have a way of eroding both, you know, the individual uh, approval rating and, and, and legislation. But we're actually starting from a really encouraging place where there is this uh, bigger consensus in the country, or at least open mind, an open mind in the country to uh, President Biden and what he's proposing that should give us some hope for for what's to come that doesn't mean that there is a uh that the, the senate uh, republican caucus is there but the division in congress and in washington is not necessarily being mirrored uh out in the country to the same degree and that's something i think it's like a pretty important thing to keep in mind as a as we think about all of these questions that we're going to talk about today and i think that the white house understanding that bipartisanship is not only going to be judged by Republican votes in the Senate, but also by Republican voters and independent voters is like a, is like a really helpful reframing of, of the question about polarization and, and partisanship. Thank Thanks you all so much. Yeah. So Can I just jump in with something Dan said was so important, this reframing of what bipartisanship means, because 
you've got right now, and we'll probably get into it later, you have Republican Party that's really uh, operating out of fear, and, and we'll talk more about it, but uh, fear of losing their seats, and they're just not even in sync with their own people. So Dan, that was a really good point you, you made. Thanks, Zoe. We're going to move on to our next panelist. I'm going to send you back down. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Sydney Brown. I am a sophomore studying political science with a minor in legal studies and a pre-professional uh, emphasis on law. Um, and I think that my question ties into what um, Dan and Senator Boxer just mentioned about bipartisanship. Um, so my question is, uh, do you all feel that it is wise and or advisable uh, for the progressive wing of the party to be willing to compromise on their priorities in order to develop a broader coalition uh, to bring about some portion of the desired change? Um, so tell me if I'm interpreting your question incorrectly. Um, I, I don't think anyone should ever compromise on their principles or priorities. Um, I think that if the progressive caucus or progressive wing of the party says, you know, we'll kind of loosen the things that we believe to get more people on board with us, that would make them not progressive. Um, but I do think as lawmakers, lawmakers always have to compromise. There's no way to get legislation through our legislative bodies without doing so. Um, so I think it's important for progressives to stand firm in what they believe in and continue to talk about those things and why they believe in them and why they're so important. But as they are trying to actually pass public policy, um, you know, you can expand, you know, if you were to expand the progressive wing of the party to include every Democrat, you still have to compromise with Republicans once you get to that point. So I think it's important for them to continue to be loud and speak about the things that are important to them. But when it comes to passing legislation and it gets to the point of compromise, talk about why they decided to make the concessions that they made and why it was so important to advance the piece of legislation that they were working on. Because um, I consider myself quite progressive, but having spent six years on the Hill, I also know that I want to see some progress over none at all. And um, it's important for people to find spaces where they can compromise, but also be very clear on what your non-negotiables are. Um, because if those things are absolutely important to you, you should stand firm on them. Well, I just want to say yes to all of that it was beautifully put. And I know I remember so well fondly Senator Hagan and how much she got done as a Southern Senator. I mean, you can imagine the, how rough it was from a really, at that point, I think it was a red state, not even a purple state. So she was quite extraordinary. But even, you know, for someone like me who was just out and out liberal, that was the word we used. We, now it's progressive, out and out liberal. Um, I never saw a compromise as a dirty word. And when I got to the Senate, if you didn't have, you know, any support on the other side of the aisle, it didn't work. Uh, what we just saw happen in the Senate is very unusual. Uh, and, and by the way, great what they did. They, they gave everyone a chance to come to the table and no one did. They said, okay, we're eating dinner and you, 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 you can't join us. But um, you know, I, I'll give a really great example to, to you, Sydney. And I was lucky to have Sydney as one of my students and when I taught there. Um, so, so when I got to the Senate, as most of you know, a lot of you may know, I was a big environmentalist, still am. And I had a really great bill that I'd worked on to put 2 million acres of land into wilderness in California. 2 million acres, I was so excited. And I had a coalition of all the environmental groups backing me because this is just gonna be gone and no one will know what it was. So, uh, I worked hard, I worked hard. I went to every congressperson. I was in the Senate to get their support, but I fell short of getting enough support in the House to get the whole bill through. I could get a million acres, not two million acres. And, um, you know, what to do? Hold out, you know, uh, get people angry and worked up enough so that you get the whole thing. At the end of the day, I met with all the groups, the environmental groups, they were divided on what to do. And I just made a decision. I'm taking the million <laughs> acres because 
After that, it turned out there were really hardly any other wilderness protection bills after that. There was just a whole mindset, no more. So luckily I did the right thing on it. But you know, there could be an argument either way, you know, did you sell out? Could should you have held out? Could you in my mind, you know, progressive to me means progress. It doesn't stand for perfect. It stands for progress. It comes from the word progress. So if I can make progress enough, I mean, not if I got, even if I got six acres, I wouldn't have done it, but I got a million acres. That's just a very clear example, but there are many, many others. And as Shiniko said, the issue is you don't compromise your principles, but you make enough accommodations around the edges so that you haven't lost your soul and you've made progress. So I think you've got to, otherwise it's a turn off and you'll get nothing done. And what's the good? Crying in the corner? It, it's foolish, you know. Grab the grab what you can when you can. Dan, you have any thoughts on that? Honestly, I agree with everything that's been said. So I, I don't have much to add to that. I think that's exactly right. You, yeah. Well, you should start the next question. So um, thanks, Sydney. Appreciate it. And we're going to move on to our next questioner. Who is going to be? Hello, I'm Christian Patel. I'm a junior at USC. Uh, my question is about both statehood and the Senate. The Senate is biased around 6.6 .6 to 8% to the right of the median voter in the nation. So my question is, do you think the Democratic Party should prioritize granting statehood to Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico, as doing so would be both pro-democracy for their residents and make the U.S. less biased against progressive policy and appointments in the future? Uh, we have a, an actual United States senator, so <laughs> we should let her answer. But I, I will just say absolutely. It's both from the standpoint of making the Senate more uh, um, democratic and less tilted um, in all the ways you said, but also it just happens to be the right thing to do. The idea that there are all these people living in uh, D.C. and in Puerto Rico who are U.S. citizens and who pay their taxes and don't get representation is um, is just wrong. And it goes back to the founding of the country with no taxation without representation. And it is... Um, it's not something that, that should be imposed uh, you know, without the consent of the people in those two jurisdictions. But um, the idea that, uh, that we have, those are, those are more people than live in many, many of the existing states we have. And so it is, it is right on the merits and then it is right from a democracy standpoint. And I think that in the past, Democrats, you know, I'm thinking particularly in the early years of the Obama administration have not prioritized the kind of structural um, pro-democracy reforms that build power and um, build fairness into the system. And as a consequence, uh, we have allowed things to get further and further out of whack. And it is, if you can get this right, whether it's dealing with the filibuster, it's expanding statehood, um, it's voting rights. <clears throat> I think probably should think about worker power in this bucket as well of things that improve our democracy. All of the, if we get all of those things uh, if we if we work on those things, it will allow us to do to build sustainable uh, power and fairness into the system, and that will allow us to do all the other things we want to do. And so um, it's hard because there's so many priorities coming at us all at once, and we have all these overlapping crises that the president talks about. But if we are not doing those structural reforms, then we're then we will not have durable majorities, and we won't be able to get get the things done we want to get done on a whole range of issues or to have them stick. So I, I think absolutely. Um, I'm going to put Puerto Rico aside just for a second and talk about DC. Uh, first of all, I've supported DC statehood forever at the whole time I was in the Congress. And the more time you spend there, the more outrageous it is the way DC is treated. It's treated like a plantation. There's no question about it. They can't make any uh, laws themselves, you know, except whatever the money they raise. So if they do a city tax, they can do some things around the edges. But everything, including a woman's right to choose, 
um, including gay rights and all the things they want to have control over, for God's sake. And as was pointed out by Dan, they, they have, uh, there are several states that have less than a million and you know, nobody thinks twice about, they have two centers. So DC is absolutely essential. I remember having debates about whether, you know, the DC city could vote to allow marijuana. It, it doesn't matter what it is. Everything is always, you know, with the overseer. It, can you do this? I don't know whether, you know, take it to the DC appropriations committee and all. It's embarrassing, it's wrong, it's antiquated, it's crazy. So as far as I'm concerned, I would figure out a way to do this very, very quickly. One of the things we learned is when we had 60 votes for five minutes, you know, we only had 60 votes for a very short period of time. We didn't do enough stuff. And, you know, if you get the chance to do the right thing, do the right thing. Now on Puerto Rico, it's a little bit more complicated for me because they have had elections about whether they want statehood or they don't want statehood. And it's right now, I believe the last vote, they did not want it, but I- as, as uh, No, in the last referendum, they voted for statehood. Okay, that was not what I was told, but if they voted for statehood and they want statehood and it was a good majority of people, I think we all look at that. But the DC thing is just, and it's, it's, it's an absolute disgrace given uh, the way things are done here. Um, and, and the fact that all the legislators are living right there. We see the problems, you know, it's just great. Look, I'll close with this, the insurrection, uh, the attack on our capital. The DC police were standing there waiting for someone to tell them, could they come in? What are you talking about? This is so crazy. It's right in the heart of their city. So if that was just an example of everybody waiting for the army to say it was okay to send for DC to send the National Guard in, um, you know, craziness. But uh, I look again at Puerto Rico, as I say, I'm just on DC, I'm like over the moon crazy about uh, on that issue. <laughs> Um, I don't have much more to add. Um, I, yeah, Puerto Rico, I think it's what the people of Puerto Rico want. Um, and in Washington, D.C., it's just the right thing to do all around. Um, I was going to mention the insurrection. There should have been no reason that um, so much had to happen when there's literally a, an attack happening on the Capitol um, because of, because D.C. is not a state. Um, and just the fact that a group of people who have been elected by pe by no one who lives in Washington DC uh, fill our United States Senate and the United States Senate has uh, sorry not Senate Congress uh, the United States Congress has so much control over a city where people have had no say in who those people are is just not right you know Eleanor Holmes Norton is elected to Congress and then doesn't get to um, to vote so I guess she can be heard, but there's no one actively representing by vote um, the residents of DC. And that is, yeah, that is just bizarre to me. I mean, when I worked on Capitol Hill, I, I still voted in North Carolina because, I mean, I was working for North Carolina members, but I also did not see the value uh, significantly of changing my registration to Washington, DC to be able to just vote for a city council and one non-voting member of Congress. I could jump in. I just checked out something for you about the turnout for the state, it was 22% because a lot of students boycotted the election. So it's the voter rolls in Puerto Rico are also inflated though. Plus there's no, a whole bunch I of- I don't other get stuff. an argument about it. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm just trying to say what I just learned, but the bottom line is it could be corrupt. I don't know what's going on with their voting. I, I'm not an expert, but what you're gonna hear from a lot of my former colleagues is we want a clear understanding because if there's only a 22% voter turnout, there may have to be another election. So I just feel that that's why there's a little bit of hesitancy. Whereas with DC, you don't see any hesitancy, but it's a very important point. And I, Christian, as a result of you, Christian, I will continue to monitor this and, uh, and become more knowledgeable, I promise on this. <laughs> Great, thanks Christian. Uh, we're gonna move on to our next question. Hello, um, my name is Quincy Hurt. Um, I'm a junior here at USC studying political science and I'm a minor in environmental studies. My question is, 
So after the election specifically, uh, but also just broadly in general, there's a lot of talk about the divisions within the Democratic Party between progressives and moderates. Um, but since inauguration, I think we've seen a very aligned party with a few exceptions. So as insiders, I guess I would ask, do you all believe these divisions uh, between the sects of the party are as stark um, and kind of legitimate as the media portrays or, uh, or not? And if it is as bad, uh, when is it going to boil over and, and result in some, some serious negative effects? Barbara, you want to take that? Do you want to go first, Barbara? Oh, no, I think Dan should because. Oh, okay, Dan, you want to go? No, because sure. I think Dan is more of an observer of, you know, the parties and the, and the, and our own party and the divisions. I'm interested, but I'll, I'll come last on this one. Well, I, I don't know if, if, if that's true for me, but I, I do look, I think we have real, um, real differences in our party. I think we saw, look, I, I lived through the primary of 2016 and I think that was like a, a, a hard fought, um, uh, battle with like real, principled debates about how to get done, uh, about how we should proceed. But I think that what we've seen both coming out of that and then certainly in this election is Democrats are actually a lot more united than Republicans are. We, whether we're arguing about whether the minimum wage should be increased to $15 an hour or 11 or 12 and then index for inflation, like we're uni unified on working people need a raise and the status quo is broken. And I think it's actually uh, been pretty remarkable about how um, uh, how unified the party's been able to be. I think we should expect there to be continuing, and there should be continuing debates in the party about uh, the sort of the right way, the right policies to get to the values that we share. Whereas if you look at the Republicans, I think Trump exposed and then exacerbated real divides in a party that maybe can't survive as, as a single entity. If you have a Trumpian wing that's basically out and out authoritarian and, you know, a sort of rump like Romney rump that is willing to sort of hold on to uh, lowercase d democratic principles. Um, it's uh, that's not super sustainable, not to mention uh, Trump kind of exposed that supply side orthodoxy doesn't really have much of a constituency out there in the among the voters of the party, but it does in the sort of DC Republican insiders, uh, like, you know, Paul Ryan types. So I think they, the Republicans have much bigger problems in terms of going forward, <clears throat> the divisions in their party. And Democrats, I think, have pretty healthy debates ahead of us, but I'm not that worried about um, uh, the, uh, the, there being irreconcilable differences or differences of values. Um, I think they're mostly differences of tactics, even if we even if we feel really strongly about them. And I, I think that that's probably healthy for the party. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I, I don't think we're going to see. I literally think what we're seeing with Republicans is it boiling over. I mean, it sounds like Trump is literally trying to split the party apart um, and, and have no regard for kind of the, the institution of the Republican Party. I, I don't think that's happening on on the left. I think there are a lot of progressives who want to see more out of the Democratic Party, and I think that's absolutely fine. And you don't get change without pushing for it. So I think we'll continue to hear them. But I think if you just look at what's happened in Congress with the bills that have been passed, the Progressive Caucus or the group of progressive um, legislators that have you know, gotten more attention than others, they have not use their power, especially now we have really small margins in the house. They have not said, you know, we're blowing up this whole bill unless you give us X, Y, Z. They have found ways to, to work together. And I think there's a lot of conversations that we're not privy to as part of the public that they are having and trying to push things. Um, but as Dan mentioned earlier, you look at the um, American Rescue Plan, it, it was really progressive. And I think that when especially in times of crisis, you can, um, when everyone's like, we just need to fix this problem now, you can, um, it's a little easier to find solutions, but I do think, yeah, I think we're having healthy debates, but I just think the American Rescue Plan is just such a really good um, kind of example of us having the same ideals and, and wanting to have the same outcomes. But I think where you see the difference is like Dan said in tactics and, you know, sometimes people believe Republicans will hop onto something and, we should go after their support and other people like me <laughs> have lost faith there. So I don't think we're going to see anything um, 
really boil over. And I think maybe where you'll see um, kind of the outcomes of any tension is gonna come from voters. And if they get sick of things, they'll start electing different people um, who will shift the party one way or another. Uh, and then those people will still be forced to work together and figure things out. Well, I think Shink was right. Um, but I and but I think both both of them are, are a little bit too optimistic. I want to talk about how I feel about the Democratic split. Um, first, I was thrilled with the American Rescue Plan and the fact that even though the minimum wage was kicked out of the bill uh, in the United States Senate, we kept the progressives. I think all of the progressives. That was a test. That was my one million, two million acre, you know, test, right? Uh, did they get everything? They really desperately wanted Quincy that fifteen dollar minimum wage, but um, they they said we'll fight on that another day. Now I don't think it's going to be so sweet necessarily going forward. Um, you know, you already see a huge fight over the filibuster. Where where am I at? I want to get do away with it, we may talk more about it later. But <clears throat> if it's not done away with, uh, how are we gonna get things done? And, and what are the those on the further left gonna do? Will they be as accommodating as they were you know, in the American Rescue Plan, which I agree is a fabulous progressive bill. Well, let me close with this. The Republican party, I definitely agree with Dan, uh, they are, they're more at sea than anything else. They're all scared of their own futures. It would be like, if God forbid you found out you had a terrible condition or disease, <laughs> everything else kind of falls by the wayside. That's what they have with Trump, a terrible disease, him. And you know the fact that if they do one thing he doesn't like, he could get someone to run against them, whether it's the House or Senate. So they're so scared looking over their shoulder, am I doing okay? Uh, you know, with Trump, they're not even focused on work. They're doing nothing, a big zero. They do nothing. They can't get it together to do anything. And it's as sad as I've ever seen. It wasn't like that when I first got there. But um, the conventional wisdom is, you know, Joe's a centrist Democrat. He did beat a lot of progressives. Um, and I frankly don't think anyone else could have won if you look at the results, I don't, I could be wrong. I think that's where the country is, left of center <clears throat> a little bit. But um, I think, and I said during the campaign when some of my more progressive friends were saying, oh my God, he's such a conservative Democrat. No, he's not. He is more a pragmatic progressive. And I use that word and people say, oh, he's not a progressive. He's a pragmatic progressive. If it works, and it can get support in the country, he's going to do it. He doesn't have a litmus test about things because he's, he's not ideological, okay? So I think that the push and pull of our party will be over the next few years, are we gonna stick with that way of doing things or are we really gonna split down the center and have an all out battle? Um, Joe doesn't wanna do single payer, he does not. He wants to make Obamacare the best it could be. He's going to move in the direction. He may lower the age for Medicare, and you may be able to get it at 60 or maybe 55. He's not going to go all the way. So I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I can't be sanguine about it. I don't know if these divisions are going to blow up. And they may blow up in the next, God, I hate to even say it, presidential race. But um, that's where we are. I, I think it's undecided whether this split is going to be bad. I hope not. Thanks, Quincy. All right, and we're gonna move on to our next question. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Anna Peterson. I'm a second year graduate student uh, studying strategic public relations with a focus on politics and public affairs. And my question is about foreign policy. The Biden administration uses the phrase a foreign policy for the middle class that reflects the economic and ethical priorities of working Americans. Where do you see the greatest points of allyship and also conflict from the progressive part of the Democratic Party regarding 
Biden's foreign policy objectives, especially when considering what seems to be a growing um, consensus for less interventionism in foreign policy. Hmm. I think uh, I think this is a really interesting and, and probably like underexamined um, uh, trend in in the in the party <clears throat> and in, in the Biden administration as well. The um, the sort of more centrist foreign the sort of Obama Clinton foreign policy establishment after 2016 made a really concerted effort to um, reach out to and absorb the progressive critique of uh, the sort of uh, democratic foreign policy. In particular, um, both Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders had started talking about uh, the, the role of corruption and oligarch, global oligarchy and um, sort of the ways that uh, international economic sort of progressive approach to international economics could also be part of a, a progressive approach, a democratic approach to foreign policy. And Jake Sullivan, who's now national security advisor and Ben Rhodes, former uh, fellow in, in our group, um, uh, created a new organization called National Security Action that, uh, that, that made a very conscious effort in the Trump years to bring progressives into the sort of foreign policy establishment. And then you see um, uh, one of uh, Senator Warren's uh, top foreign policy aides is now a senior aide at the National Security Council. And you hear this rhetoric about foreign policy from the middle class, which I think is like a legitimate rethinking of, okay, we need to, from um, sort of people like Jake to say like, and, and from the president to say, we need to uh, be sent rooting our approach to foreign policy more in actually what's good, not just uh uh, good for American workers, and American families, and that, that will be most evident in the approach to trade, I think, where too often um, a sort, of, uh, sort of what was good for American corporations was viewed as a proxy for what's good for America, as opposed to what's good for American workers and working families. I do think your question is right, that the place where this is going <clears> to, <throat> where there's going to be tension is um, on questions about intervention, uh, inter you know, drone strikes and things like that. I think we're going to see some, some real debates. Um, but there's like growing consensus, uh, for instance, that we need a new authorization to use military force, that the one um, that passed after 9-11 that's been used as an authorization to fight all of the sort of long, uh, endless global war on terror has is out is long since outrun its usefulness or legality and that there needs to be a, a, a rethinking of that and probably new legislation. That's not just a left wing position. That's like there's a broad, I think, in growing consensus across um, the Democratic Party about that. And so I do think there has been there has been um, a movement to to um, to bring more progressive ideas into the uh, Democratic sort of foreign policy establishment. And while we still have like and should have points of contention. I do think it's actually really interesting where they're heading and how they make this foreign policy for the middle class real is one of the tests that um, you know uh, for the for the first couple of years that we're gonna have to see what they come up with. But I, I think the commitment to figure this out is real. Um, I'll talk from my purchase. Someone who served for years on the um, Foreign Affairs Committee with them. Um, Joe Biden and others, John Kerry, et cetera. Um, I have to say foreign policy for the middle class as a slogan, I don't get it. Foreign policy has to be for everybody, but as it relates to trade, Dan, you're absolutely right. That I can see. But to me, I don't want to do foreign policy just for one class of people. I'm sitting there trying to protect everybody from not getting nuked, you know, by the crazy man in North Korea. So I think as it relates to trade, it's a great slogan and I support it because I voted against several free trade agreements and I voted I voted against one when Obama was really mad at me because um, I have a 50-50 record on trade. 50% I voted for trade agreements, 3% I didn't. And that new one, that the last one, what was it called, Dan? The Asia? The TPP. One, yeah. I, I couldn't support that. So uh, he was mad and, and, and I understood that. But the bottom line is uh, that when you look at trade policy, it better be for our middle-class people or we're gonna lose the jobs in, in this particular one, we were gonna 
have free trade with people who paid 14 cents an hour or something. So I just can't go there. So I so that's a side, but I think, Anna, if I could get, I think what you were trying to get at is what Dan also touched on, the intervention and getting involved in military excursions. Was that part of your question? Yeah. So um, here's what I think will happen. Joe Biden is a, he comes from that same generation as I, old, we're old, but we come from the generation of World War II, you know, after the aftermath of World War II and the building up of NATO and, this, and the strong alliances for freedom in Europe combined with America and uh, the, uh, the wonderful changes that happened with Germany because of all that and Japan. And so, you know, with, with Joe Biden, with President Biden, um, I think you're going to see a, a very, not a go it alone policy, uh, but more, uh, more work with our NATO uh, alliance and also our Asian friends um, in the world. It's going to be, uh, you know, not a me foreign policy, but a, like Trump did, which is, oh, I woke up this morning and I, I fell in love with, with the North Korean leader. I mean, that was just, we're lucky we're here to talk, let's put it that way. But I think we're going to see you know, we're going to go back to kind of a more normal, a, a more normal time. Uh, but also, I agree with Dan on his point about the uh, making sure Congress gets back the power to declare war, uh, because it's absolutely true, because we have that terribly old policy from going after uh, bin Laden. And any road that took us anywhere there, pres a president, Bush, whoever it was, could just start attacking people. <laughs> and saying you're a threat to us. And, and Congress is, especially Tim Kaine and others are very upset about this. And I think that's gonna be a place to watch. Anything to add, Shaniqua? Nothing for me, no. Hi, Anna. <laughs> All right, we're gonna move on to our next question. It is also a member of Shaniqua's class. A lot of, lot of people from your class today, Shaniqua. Hi, my name is Diego Andradas. I'm an IMA sophomore at USC studying political science, politics, philosophy, law, and a minor in legal studies. Um, my question has more to do with how do we create a more diverse array of candidates. Um, right now, if you look at state legislatures and the federal le legislature, you see a lot of older white men. You don't see as many uh, candidates from multiracial backgrounds. Um, so right now, Black and Indigenous people of color um, who are running for office only have a 2% chance of winning um, in majority white districts. While at the same time, white candidates have a strong likelihood of winning, even if it's a majority minority district. So how do you think the party will adapt, if at all, to support a more uh, racially diverse array of candidates? Um, I, hi, Diego, um, have so many thoughts on this. Um, you know, I'm not intimately familiar with that data, but I just have to imagine that, you know, there are so many times that um, Democratic Party committees tell people who, candidates who can and cannot run. And so I imagine that the numbers might look a little different if people of color were not told that they could not win in majority white districts. Um, and so I do hope that the party starts to change in that way. And it, I'm from North Carolina. Um, I don't know if Erica Smith could have uh, beat Tom Tillis, but I know Cal Cunningham did not beat Tom Tillis. And so you know, should they have gotten the DS gotten in so early to decide who should get to win that um, uh, that primary race. Uh, and so I think the change that needs to happen is to let voters decide in primaries, you know, if and 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 then when candidates get out of primaries support them, you know, I think what we Marquita uh, Bradshaw in Tennessee, you know, the DS did not want her to win she won the primary and then did not get any support after now I guess obviously they can make the claim that, well, there was no need to support her. It's Tennessee, we can't win there. Um, but I just, I don't know. Mississippi was getting a ton of attention. That was always going to be a very hard race. Um, so I think first and foremost, we have to stop picking win winners and losers. 
but aside from that, we have to build infrastructure. There are, I think Georgia is a perfect example of what happens when you make long-term investments in infrastructure and don't only invest in candidates, but actually invest in voters and their communities because you can run whoever you want, but if voters don't believe that voting will have an impact, a material impact on their lives, it doesn't matter who's on the ticket. Um, so I think that investment needs to happen and, and we don't need to center all of our work around elections. Right now we're in 2021, most people will call that an off year. Uh, but I mean, one, there are elections happening this year so we should never call it an off year. But two, if we're thinking about the midterms we should be starting um, the process now to engage voters in a lot of states. Uh, Republicans did a lot more voter registration or they outpaced us on voter registration because they continued to do in-person work when Democrats were rightfully so being safe. Um, but that is some work that we can close the gap on now. Um, so I think generally we need to stop picking win winners and losers. We need to support candidates of color the same way we support other, um, well, other, <laughs> the same way we support white candidates, particularly white male candidates. Um, I don't think we have to believe that only white men who have served in the military are the types of Democrats that can win in the South um, and just be open. I mean, a progressive reverend won in Atlanta. And I think that should tell us a lot about what's possible throughout the country when these candidates have um, institutional support behind them. I'd like to jump in. I think, Diego, don't be so sad for this reason. In this 117th Congress, it's the most racially and ethnically diverse in history. And uh, hey, it's not enough, it's 23%. Uh, that's the number in the House. In, in the Senate, it's, it's worse, I'm sure. But, you know, having been somebody who served there when there were, there were two women, then when I came in, there were six women, now there's 25%. Um, I agree with this statement, don't pick winners and losers in terms of the parties, but that's what elections are about, you pick winners and losers. So, but what I think you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, that the powers that be should let the voters decide. Absolutely. I mean, and that's that's important. And actually, as we're looking around, some of the state parties that are very powerful in California, it's really we don't see too much weighing in here in primaries. Uh, but in those states, you can run against the machine and win too. You know what I mean? You could you can have the heart to turn it around. But I do think, Diego, you should be encouraged in the sense. Um, because we now have social media, which has its pros and cons of God knows we all know that from someone who's been called every name in the book and God knows what else. Uh, but it's still a way to reach a lot of people. It means it's possible for folks who haven't been in the party or, you know, in a special interest to get into these races, you know, and kind of grab the imagination of people. So I, I tell you my view on this, Diego. I so believe because I challenged the system and I lost at first and then I won a lot. Um, you can do it. And there's something about that, you know, about being, you know, man against the machine or whatever it is that really pushes you and gets you, um, no, people notice you. And so if you do look at Congress and you look behind the numbers, there are some fantastic people who got elected who you wouldn't believe I could have ever gotten elected, you know, 10, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So I'm optimistic on the point. Last thing is reapportionment. That's a problem in a lot of places. The way they draw the districts, right? They take away power from minorities. And that's, that's a bad thing and I'm hopeful. And I was wrong on that issue. Boy, I hate to admit it. Years ago, Dan, I tell you, say in particular, that I was again, I said, look, if a state legislature if, you, if you're in the majority, you have a right to draw the districts. I was wrong. And I think these commissions that are fairly put together, it's a way better way and it will result in a more diverse country. Diversity is the name of the game. As Nancy Pelosi says, diversity is our strength. It is our, it is our power. The only thing I would add, I mean, I think everything that's been said is spot on. The only thing I would add um, based on uh, my, frustrations of trying to elect the first woman president and running into so many different buzzsaws. Not the problems that we need to take on are not just institutional barriers about what the party is or is not doing, but how the media covers candidates, 
how voter, the kind of biases that voters project onto candidates. And I think the more that we um, raise awareness and understanding about sort of how it's harder for, um, for uh, candidates of color or women to, whether it's raise money or, or get positive coverage or whatever, and that we can start breaking down those um, implicit biases. And I think that there's some, there's a role basically for everyone voter, you know, voters included to play in, in this process. And then we, it's not just a top-down institutional problem that is real. I, I really, I feel like the difference between how um, people like jumped over all, all over examples of sexist coverage in the 2020 primaries that they did not do in 2016 is an example of progress of people sort of tuning into some of these barriers more and biases. And I hope that that process continues as we get more candidates uh, sort of in the arena and that becomes more normalized. Um, but there is something for all of us to do there to sort of call it out when we see it. Thanks, Diego. <clears throat> to our, this will be our last student question. Might have time for one from my list. Un Hi. Hi, could you just give us uh, your name, major and year? Yes, hi, I'm Chloe Hirth. I'm a junior studying political science and communications on the pre-law track. Uh, thank you all for being here. I just had a quick question. Um, many rising figures of progressivism in the Democratic Party are younger, including many women of color, such as AOC and other members of the squad. Um, how do you think these young people, particularly young women of color, will develop the party? Are there any rising stars in your opinion? Anybody want to take that first? I can um, jump in. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I think it's so important that um, like women in color uh, generally, but younger women of color are beginning to take up more space in the party because something that I think, well, I hope all people know, um, and if they did, I wouldn't have to even say it right now, but something that I know to be true is that when you center um, the most uh, marginalized people that you help lift all the boats or, I'm not going to, I always mess up that little saying, but um, if we center women of color who often face, um, you know, the oppressive factors of being of color and also of being women, um, if we center the things that help them, we'll be able to help everyone. And so I, I know that people in places of privilege often are like, well, what about the things that I have? Am I going to have to let those go? Um, and not everything. Um, I, I honestly think it's more about, you know, understanding um, these structures that exist, but to your actual question, um, I think it's gonna make the difference because issues that are not often talked about, uh, experiences um, and perspectives that are not often reflected in our public policy, they now have a voice at the table. There's now someone with that perspective um, uh, talking about it. And to your other question about um, kind of uh, rising stars, I think Okay, this kind of goes opposite to the young women of color. Um, two people though that I have found interesting, um, and this first one is kind of obvious um, and probably will sound cliche at this uh, point, but I'm still just very inspired by Stacey Abrams. Um, I think she has done a lot of work for a very long time and is now just getting kind of that national recognition for it. Uh, but even her run in 2018 for governor, um, you know, she did not win. There was a lot of factors that went into that, but she ran an amazing campaign and got more votes than any, you know, other Democrat who has won statewide in Georgia, including Barack Obama. And after she lost, she didn't, you know, just kind of go to Georgia and hide out. She created a national organization to help put voter protection teams um, throughout the country, voter protection teams that were being hired at the beginning of 2020 and helped uh, help Democrats be on the offense against voter suppression instead of you know being a few weeks out and trying to figure out what to do then. The other person I would say who um, is young but is not a woman, uh, Savante Myrick, um, the, the mayor of Ithaca, New York. Um, I remember hearing about him when he was elected um, and then I found out one of my friends went to college with him and I was just like, oh my gosh, that is like the coolest thing in the world. But, um, I hosted a panel with him while I was in graduate school and you know I always thought it was cool that he was like this young mayor but also heard about the larger work that he was doing with the, the Democratic Party to help build the pipeline um, of uh, 
of, of young Democrats um, who would eventually go on to lead the party. And then most recently looking at the work that he's doing around um, reforming um, just the relationship uh, between police and communities of color. So I think he is doing a lot of innovative work um, that, I mean, I think he's gonna be around for a really long time, but I think as mayor of you know, Ithaca, it's not New York City, um, he's been able to really carve out a path for himself and demonstrate what's possible um, you know, when you kind of work towards those ideals we all have, but approach it in a unique way. Well, I could pop in and say, you know, there's so much talent in the Congress. I love watching uh, the new members, the young members, the women, the men, the people of color that, you know, I'm thinking back to the House um, impeachment group, the House managers, uh, Congressman Nagus, who I, I just thought he was incredible. And now he's the as we know, he's on the front lines because of the Boulder shooting. He's magnificent. Um, so I have a lot of favorites. I have to say Stacey Abrams is number one in my book. And you know why it's, this is gonna sound funny, but with Stacey Abrams, it's not about her. It's not, it's not, it's about us. It's about the country. And so you have to make a distinction between people who are out there um, who are very good and talented and attractive and lovely and smart and great. It, it, that's all good. But when you find someone like a Stacey Abrams, I'm so glad you brought it up. I had her, I ran a pack, I don't now. Um, I volunteered for it for the last several years. She was my first guest and she came to a group and um, no one knew who she was. This was really before she became so out there on all these things. And she, um, she was asked a question by somebody who said, person has a mom who's addicted and she didn't know how to handle it. The woman who asked the question was about 30 years old. And Stacy just stepped back and she said, I wanna tell you a story. And she told about her own experience with a sibling who was drug addict and how many interventions she made. And she looked at this woman from, you know, a thousand feet away and as if she was the only one in the room and she said, it's not your fault. So what she's able to do is, is give people a sense of power, okay? Empowerment, not her power, but our power. So I think as you evaluate leaders, you will have you, some that you fall in love with and that's all good, but make sure you sit back and say, are they really in it for me? <laughs> because bottom line is that's what it's supposed to be about. And somebody said, what do you want on your tombstone? I hate to say that. I don't even know if I'll have a tombstone, but be that as it may, it's a horrible question. People were asking me when I was 40, you know, I was like, what do you want on your tombstone after you've been in politics? But I said, she did everything she could to help everybody she could, you know, and that to me is what it's about. So tons of rising stars and look at them with that lens and you'll find some extraordinary people. I don't and have anything to add to that. I think that's, <laughs> I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Chloe. Um, so we just got through all of our student questions right at about the top of the hour, which is perfect timing. So I just want to say thank you to all of our questioners, our USC students. Thanks to all of our amazing panelists and fellows. And thank you to all of you for watching here and on Facebook and through our podcast. Our next and last uh, CPF fellows roundtable will be on April 16th at 1 p.m. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter, follow us on social media, at USC Poll Future to get updates on panelists and what the topic will be. Uh, until then, we'll see you next time.